Hi, and welcome to another Fashion in the Tea webinar. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Um, before we start, I just want to mention that everyone aside from me and Laura is on mute, just so that everyone can hear us clearly without any background noise. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to type them in the group chat as you have been already, and we'll be going through and answering those at the end. Um, if you haven't heard of us before, Fashion the Free is a platform I created earlier last year to give the real people in the fashion industry a voice to share their stories, knowledge and expertise in the hope it inspires and educates other professionals and students. You can check out the website fashionandthefree.com and on Instagram at fashionandthefree. So for anyone that doesn't know, I'm Emma, the founder of Fashion the Free, and I'm very excited to introduce my guest today, Laura Flanagan. So Laura is not only the author of our online series, Diary of a Fashion Expat, she's also a lingerie, sleep and lounge designer and buyer, and has been in the fashion industry for over 10 years. Laura began her career in her home country of England, working in London and Manchester for brands including Debenhams and Marks and Spencers, and has since lived and worked in Hong Kong and Australia. Currently based in Sydney, I'm extremely grateful that Laura has taken the time out of her busy schedule to share her knowledge, advice and top tips for today's discussion, finding your dream job overseas, how to navigate life as a fashion expat. So hi, Laura, welcome and thank you for being here today. So tell us what's going on in sunny Sydney right now. So it's not actually that sunny, as I was saying, we're having... Um, Unfunny Sydney. <laughs> yeah, we're having a bit of a rainy situation at the moment. But um, yeah, all good. We're working from home. So I'm currently working for a lingerie brand out here, one of the biggest brands in Australia. Um, and we've been really lucky throughout the whole pandemic, etc. Our sales have been pretty strong. We're growing as a brand. So very feeling very lucky to be at a company like that. Yeah. Um, and we're just doing a combination of working from home and working in the office. So, yeah, you're learning a lot of new skills doing that. So I've had today at home, which I really enjoy. I live like five minute walk from the beach. So at lunch, you know, I can head down there and really sort of have a sort of better lifestyle, a bit more flexible than if you're in the office five days a week. So, so you're kind yeah. of living the expat dream a little bit right now, yeah. at least compared to yeah. what some people are at the moment. Yeah, trying to definitely. It's a funny time to be an expat. I'm sure you agree. I'm like, yeah, you, there's some benefits to it at the moment, like, um, but also you're you just don't know when you're going to see your family again or your friends at home. Yeah, that's definitely the hardest bit, and I think, I think probably last year none of us could have imagined it would have been this no. long since we've seen our family and friends. And I think that's definitely, I mean, that's something we can get into during this chat, but it's definitely probably maybe one of the downsides of being an expert yeah. is not that, you know, you encounter a pandemic every year, but when you do and, you know, so something, a situation arises, you know, there's just such a huge distance then between family and friends and, you know, especially in your situation. I know Australia has been quite strict with, when you're even allowed to leave and yeah. all of that. So that's quite hard. I think um, it highlights that if there are any down points to being an expat, it's just highlighted in this sort of situation. Yeah, totally. It just like magnifies the distance mm. a little bit, I think. Um, so obviously I've known you a long time, so I know all about your career history. Yeah. But for obviously everyone tuning in, I would love for you to just tell us, um, you know, about your journey in the fashion industry, you know, what uni you went to and if you did internships and then like, like kind of when you landed your first job. Sure. So I was doing our A-level back in the UK, which is kind of like the qualifications you do when you're like 16, 18. And um, art, art was just my favorite subject. So I knew I wanted to do something creative and I just wasn't sure what. I didn't really mind what it was, to be honest. I just knew I wanted to make a career out of something creative. So I felt that fashion could be quite a commercial career and I was just leaning that way. You know, when you're that kind of age, you're just flicking through the fashion magazines. You're just it's like another world to you really. So yeah, I decided to start looking at university courses for fashion. Um, and I'll be honest, I was too nervous to go down to London, even though that's probably the best place to go in the UK, obviously. So I ended up going to a university called Northumbria, and that's up in Newcastle, and it's got a really good reputation. But then I had the safety net of being in like a town not too far from home, etc. cetera. Um, so it was a really great experience. It was a four-year course. It had a really good reputation in the industry. 
and it was four years because they it was compulsory that you had to take a year out um, and go and work in the industry doing internships so I think that's good because you if you had the choice it's easy to skip that it's not an easy thing to go and do so because we had to do it to pass the year um, I think you had to do a minimum of nine months to pass the year so you really had to try and fill that year so I knew straight away I wanted to try something overseas. Um, so I decided to get one in Manchester and move back home for a little bit really quickly and just so I could start saving some money. So I was just at a styling agency in Manchester. It probably wasn't the most exciting one, but you know what? They paid me. So that was good. It's a rarity at that point. <laughs> yeah, they were just a small company and the, you know, the styling they were doing wasn't particularly exciting. It was probably more like middle-aged women coming in who just didn't know how to dress really and we'd work with them on colors and shapes and stuff um, but I enjoyed just having that exposure and being able to put some money like aside while I was living at home yeah. and then in the meantime I was just applying for whatever I could overseas um, and a couple of things came up um, some stuff in New York which obviously just blows your mind that you could even go there and have that experience I know that's what you did um, yeah. um, and I didn't end up getting that role, but then one came up for a position in Paris and it was a trend agency called Carlan. And when I got it, um, they told me that I'd be in the lingerie and beauty department. So I thought, cool, I'm down for that um, and got there. And I guess that's what really kickstarted me into lingerie because you're just, I mean, you're in Paris and it's like the lingerie fashion capital of the world. Um, and yeah, I just fell in love with Paris, really. It was such a great experience, even getting the metro to work and walking down the streets. That was like a highlight of my day. Yeah. The role at the trend agency wasn't particularly difficult. It was more like admin based. Like this is back in the day when we didn't have Pinterest or Instagram. Mm -hmm. So I'd go through magazines, I'd get magazines ordered weekly um, and I'd, they'd pull out what they liked, the images. Yeah pull them out and then put them in a pile and I'd file them into the trays like one would be florals or this one's about architecture and it seems really archaic now but it was a great job because you're just looking at nice images and filing them away so it was I things think that's like that. a nice thing to do though I, I miss that like we used to do I remember we used to do that kind of thing even at Debenham yeah. and I yeah. did miss that like you know tearing off magazines mm. and like don't really do that so much now I can't remember the last time I did it it's all digital. Like. I know, it's kind of sad. Yeah, so yeah, it was a great little internship. It, I probably didn't learn as much as some of the other students had in terms of like job skills, but I, I had an experience overseas, so I was happy. And then I went back to Newcastle to finish off the degree. Um, and I'd say actually first year, second year, and obviously third year, we kind of had the year out. They weren't that hard, but then fourth year, when you've got to produce a dissertation and a final collection, wow, I still, I still don't forget it. Like it's the hours you did were just insane. It was like a full-time job. And then like all the homework that came with it. Yeah. Um, and I made, I think I made a bit of a mistake by not living with girls off my course. I thought it would be good to live with girls that were doing something different. So I wasn't completely consumed by it. Yeah. But I it, I don't think they really got what I was dealing with and you know I think one of them was in eight hours a week whereas we were like at the studio in the university from 7 a.m till probably 7 p.m and then we'd come home and carry on working um, and then you just kind of squeeze your social life which at university is pretty like alcohol orientated yeah um, and that so yeah it was pretty full-on um, and I was just really glad when it was done and you could take a bit of a breather um, so yeah, I graduated with a 2-1. Um, obviously in the UK, the, the thing you're all aiming for is a first. Um, so I think I was a couple marks off a first. And I remember at the time being really upset about it. But I think a week later, I'd kind of got over it. I realised it wasn't really going to hinder me at all. And it was more just a personal goal. I don't even think they look at it. If I'm, I mean, I could be no. wrong. But like, I don't, I think once you get to a certain point in your career, it just doesn't even get looked at anyway. So it's, you know, obviously I get, yeah. I get the need for people to strive to, to achieve that. And I was the same as you, I kind of just missed that first and it was gutting at the time. And then, like you said, you just quickly get over it and like, right, let's get into the real world. <laughs> Completely agree. Yeah. So I was also really lucky as well. I'd, we um, exhibited at Graduate Fashion Week. Mm -hmm. um, so we 
basically got a little platform to show our work to the industry, which is great. Yeah. Um, and there was a scout there looking for um, a graduate designer, again, very lucky in lingerie. Yeah. So I managed to get a role at this company and just by chance it was in Manchester. So that meant I moved back home, um, which after uni you don't mind doing because you're just so exhausted, aren't you? You're just like, you just want to go home and be looked after and um, <laughs> start the job. So it was quite a smooth transition. Um, and the first job, it was, the title was graduate designer and it was... Again, it wasn't particularly challenging. I was just so happy to have got that platform and be in there because I knew how hard it was. Yeah. Um, and I think it took, you know, some friends nearly two years to get their first thing. So I, would, I, I wasn't stupid. I knew I was really grateful to uh, and lucky to have it. Yeah. Um, so I was there for seven months because unfortunately that company then went into administration. So the whole company was made redundant because yeah, hard. we it was basically just after the 2008 crash wasn't it yeah so, so yeah it was hard times um but as I mentioned in the article I was really grateful of that experience but I wasn't completely gutted that it had been made redundant because I just had this feeling where I felt a bit flat there because university had been so intense and you'd worked so hard and then it just felt like oh this job is nice yeah, um, life's okay in Manchester nothing to complain about but it wasn't the adventure I'd maybe wanted so um I kind of decided after looking for a couple of other jobs in Manchester and there wasn't really anything around I kind of decided just to take a gap year that well not a gap year a few months out really yeah. um, and I had some friends traveling they'd already planned their travels to go to Southeast Asia so I just tagged along with that and yeah. before, a few months before I just worked in a, a restaurant to save some money but it was a great time. It was just, you know, no, no worries, no responsibilities, save some money for this amazing trip, you know, you're going on. Yeah. And then, yeah, then I got back and I knew I was like, I was ready for it. And I was like, okay, I've had a little break. Um, I want to get back in this industry, you know, and go for it. And I think after being overseas for a couple of months, backpacking Manchester, I knew it was just not enough. I, that's, I was like, I'm ready for London now. So race in a big city. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And like it's addictive. So I have already had a few friends down there. And once you've had a couple of weekends down there and everything that's going on, you're having so much fun. Yeah, I just couldn't get it out of my mind and I just really wanted to move down there. So um I was quite again quite lucky. Something came up quite quickly, but it wasn't probably ideal. It was back then, it's when the Labour government were in um power and they had a graduate scheme where they were giving funding to small businesses so they could employ graduates. Now I don't, I can't imagine that existing in the UK right now. It's so different, but um, yeah, back then it's great that they had that. So it meant I could have this role at the small laundry company, which normally wouldn't be able to employ me. Um, don't get me wrong, the pay was very low, but again, it's okay, it's, it's something, it's gonna get me somewhere. So the pay was that low, I actually couldn't afford rent. So it was a temporary contract. So I think, I think it was around four to five months. And I thought, you know what, I'm just gonna have to go down and just crash with friends the whole time. I was really lucky, I had so many friends from uni and back home who'd started to move down to London. And a lot of people were in similar situations. So everyone understood. So. I'd stay two weeks at one person's house and then move on to the next and the whole time just kind of trying to say thank you by cooking them dinner or buying them presents or whatever. Um, so yeah, I'll never forget the friends that helped me out then because yeah, I wouldn't have really been able to do it otherwise. Um, and I was also quite lucky. I had a friend who I think she'd managed to get a graduate role at Topshop at the time. Um, she had a salary just enough to cover some rent. So she had a room in a converted warehouse in Hackney Wick. Oh, wow. So it was huge. And she was like, mate, you can crash here for like a month or whatever. So that's that took me off a bit. Yeah. And yeah. then it's hard when um, you first start out in London, just the salaries. I don't know if it's the same now, but I think I was very much the same. I was definitely living off my credit card and I got very, yeah. very lucky with finding a cheap apartment, but I don't know how else I would have done it. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's um, definitely gives you a few life lessons, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. 
So then after that, was Debenhams your next job after that? So after that, I actually um, I actually ended up going back up to Manchester just because I was like, I can't yeah. like this much longer. The company were like, we're offering me a permanent role and the, with a salary increase, but it was still so low. And I was just like, do you know what? I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it properly. So I went back up to Manchester and I managed to get a job quite quickly um, with a supplier doing sleepwear. So again, it wasn't exactly like where I wanted to be, but I just thought, you know, it's all going on my resume. Like this is, this is all going to get me somewhere. And then that's why I was thinking just you'll get there eventually. So I ended up doing a year at this supplier. Um, and again, the salary was so low there, but I could live at home. So I didn't have any rent to pay. And yeah. I thought this is an opportunity to save some money um, for when I do move down to London. So I actually got a waitressing job in the evening as well, mm -hmm. just so I could build up some savings. So that was a pretty hectic year, a lot of working hours. But then I was also hopping on the train down to London every other weekend just because I was loving it down there. Um, so it's probably spent a year not really being where I wanted to be and my heart, like my heart being down in London, but I was living up in Manchester. Um, and I was getting a bit fed up. It was getting on for a year. And then very luckily I managed to get the job at Debenhams. Yeah. Um, and I got to move down in the January, which was really nice just to have Christmas at home mm -hmm. and make a fresh start in January down in London. Um, and that's where I met you. Um, <laughs> little place to work um it's very social isn't it oh I mean yeah Debenhams I have to say I mean it's such a shame what's going on with Debenhams like after the pandemic and everything but you know it's still even now is one of my most favorite places I ever worked and it really yeah. is more down to the people than anything else because I think I mean I because I was ready for something new and I was ready to work somewhere a bit more trendy but it was really hard like leaving people and I think the fact that I think you'd already gone like way gone by that point and yeah. one of our other friends were kind of leaving around then and it just you know is really about people and them making a place and I think the Agreed. more people that started leaving the more I was like oh it's not the same anymore <laughs> yeah no I agree like socially it was the best job I've ever had like yeah it's really it's a really nice vibe and relax too you know I feel like yeah. you could still have a really good time in London and not worry too much about it you know if you if you're yeah. really hung over it really yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> i think it was yeah i think i mean the, i think all the senior designers were doing the same anyway so oh, was, worse. <laughs> yeah <laughs> totally um and i remember looking at them and they had the back then they had these amazing trips didn't they shopping trips and just i think that's what kept you going thinking that will be me one day i will get to go on a trip i will get to do this yeah it's definitely one of the I mean it's one of the reasons I even wanted to go into fashion apart from the fact that I loved it I knew that it was supposedly somewhere you went that you could travel a lot and yeah. I got very lucky during my time at Debenhams that I did there was a period of time where I was traveling every few weeks and it was probably one of the best times of my life because I was just doing exactly what I wanted to be doing and got the energy for it as well at that age hundred well, percent I was like they're like can you go to Barcelona in two weeks I'm like yeah no problem and they're like yeah, oh and we need you in Istanbul the week after like, yeah just, I'll be fine yeah <laughs> add it in <laughs> now I'd be like oh gosh I can have a break yeah <laughs> so then yeah. after Debenhams um you went on to m and and then there was kind of a period of time in between that and then you making this huge move to Hong Kong. So I guess like yeah. you know, obviously what we're trying to talk about here as well is, you know, moving abroad and everything. So how did that even come about? Is that something in the back of your mind that you'd always wanted to do? And, you know, what made yeah, you decide think... like, do you know what? I really want to try working overseas and I'd also aside from that as well I'd love to know how you even then go about that because I'm sure there's a lot of people listening now that it's crossed their mind but they wouldn't even know where to start yeah um I'll be honest it probably I've always liked travel but it probably wasn't on my mind to move overseas and grab a job I think it came I'll be honest it came out of desperation I was back in London um I'd been away traveling again and the job market was just awful, um, like the worst I'd ever seen it. And I was getting offers, but they were the worst offers because by this point I had a decent amount of experience and the offers I were getting were like, I had zero, zero enthusiasm for the role 
and the pay was like way worse than what I'd left on. So I think I just reached a point where I was like, is it me or is it London? I need to know. So I just started Googling jobs, like literally just went on Google, lingerie job in, and I thought of some of the places I wouldn't mind living, like Hong Kong. And some started to come up and then you get put on recruiter agency websites and you're like, oh, here's one. And you just start applying. Um, and I think what I learned from that is you probably always keep a record, which I do now. If you apply for something, put it in a spreadsheet, put the name of the website, put um, the date you applied for it, what, what you applied for, because it can get very messy very quickly. Yeah. Um, so I, had, I applied for a few jobs in Hong Kong, a few jobs in Dubai and some in Australia. I didn't hear back from any in Australia. And I think that's probably to do with the fact I'd already used my working holiday visa, which is a visa you get in the UK that's very easy to go over to Australia. Um, I think you can get up to, to nearly two years if you do some of your some farm work while you're out here. So I'd already used that. And that meant I would have had to be officially sponsored, um, which isn't that easy in Australia. Um, and then Dubai and Hong Kong, the visa situation was a lot more relaxed. It's a lot easier to get it. So I think that's why they were in contact straight away. So I was interviewing parallel with a role in Hong Kong and a role in Dubai. Um, and I don't know, my gut feeling just told me to go to Hong Kong. I'm a big believer in that feeling. And I think I'm probably just more suited to the culture of Hong Kong because yes, it can be very fast paced, city orientated and glamorous, but it's also got that Asian side to it where you can experience the local culture. You can go out to the national parks and you can go hiking and go to the beaches. And I'd, I'd heard about this lifestyle and I was like, yeah, I think that's more me. And I could be wrong, but my impression of Dubai, like I've never been, but I heard it's more glamorous. Um, and I think it probably just wasn't um, as suited to me. So I got, after a couple of interviews, um, the company in Hong Kong also had an office in London. So I went there to a team and did a project for them. And then I had a job offer. So it kind of shocked me because I was kind of like, I'd already like just started it as a test really to see if I was employable and then it yeah it happened and then it made me realize it wasn't me it was unfortunately the market in London at the time um so it was a really difficult decision to make um to go to Hong Kong it's probably the hardest decision I've ever had to make because at the time I was living with a partner in London and he was not willing to come out with me he had he had his own business in London his own property totally get it but um yeah I had to listen really listen to my gut feeling there yeah that's one of the hardest things I think is that when and obviously I'm not going to talk about me very much in this but obviously I've gone through a similar process and yeah. it's one of the hardest things is that when you actually come close to oh actually this could be a reality you do just yeah. not think like oh my gosh what am I leaving behind you know regardless whether you know it's a boyfriend or just family or friends yeah. or you know you do stop and think oh my gosh what am I giving up here and I yeah. think the closer you get to it the more it becomes a reality and it, yeah you just have to think it's important to take your time with it a little bit and if you have to take yeah. a few days to think it over then that's fine you know you can't don't have to jump the gun if you get the offer and everything yeah I've, I've never really I've never done this with a job offer before but I asked for like two weeks to think about it um, oh, good. and it was good they gave it me because yeah well it was just, really wanted um, yeah. Yeah, I think if I had someone saying that to me now, a candidate, I'd, alarm bells would go off. I'd be like, oh, she, they might not really want it. Um, so yeah, it's good they were accommodating for me. Yeah, so once obviously you had your offer and you decided that you wanted to go, um, what was the visa process like for Hong Kong? Because I know obviously it varies from country to country. Yeah. So they were a little bit more relaxed. So how long did you have to wait? And did you have to hire a lawyer? You know, what was your procedure? I'll be honest it was really easy for Hong Kong yeah. really yeah I think I filled out one form oh and in the express post and then they sent me back a sticker that I put in my passport and I was good to go for two years that's yeah. amazing yeah. it's oh and then gosh. obviously I ended up staying a while so it had to be renewed at times yeah. but it was the process there was no immigration lawyer or oh. advice Needed. it was I think the only thing I had to send over was some um scans of my educational certificates 
Oh my gosh, someone um, just asked, normally I leave the questions to the end, but this one's kind yeah. of relevant to what we're saying. He said, how, so sorry, what year was this that you um, took this position and did the visa? I went out to Hong Kong in 2015. So almost, almost six years ago now. Oh my God. Yeah. I think the visa situation is still the same there. Obviously, just politically, a lot has changed there recently. Yeah, 100%. Um, I don't, I didn't even know. Do you have any friends that are still there or? Yeah, like um, surprisingly more have stayed than I thought they would. Um, yeah. They still feel safe day to day. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's a bit of an expat sort of bubble. Like we all lived in certain areas. Yeah. And you know, before any of this stuff happened, Hong Kong I would say is one of the safest places I've ever been. Maybe bar Singapore, um, yes, yeah, so safe, which was obviously a lovely thing to have when you live there. Oh, especially as um, a girl on your own moving to another country yeah. as well. I think safety is like, you know, to just feel safe, even just for like family and friends, peace of mind back home. It's always- Yeah, nice. totally. Yeah. Um, so I remember when I visited you in Hong Kong all those years ago, that one of the things you said was really difficult was things like getting, especially somewhere like Hong Kong, obviously it's the language, yeah. was getting things like doctors set up and banks up. So what was, what, what were the biggest challenges you faced? You know, was it even like finding a place to live? Like, what would you say is the hardest bit about, you know, making that move overseas? And is it different, you know, with Australia to compared to Hong Kong as well? Yeah, I think, I think it's always hard wherever you go. Even if I went back to the UK tomorrow, it'd be hard because you just got to set everything up and it takes ages and it's, it's not fun, is it? Queuing at a bank and then going to the mobile phone store and whatever. It's just all admin. So I think in terms of Hong Kong, when I got there, I booked an Airbnb for two weeks just to cover myself where I found some accommodation. And I'm, I'm pretty organised. So before I'd taken the flight, like the week before, I'd looked on some websites for flats um, and I knew I wanted to share with other expats so I could meet people yeah. um, actually I say other expats I was, I was just totally open I would have shared with anyone um, yeah. but most of the flats that came up were with expats yeah um, so I viewed a couple on my first day the day I landed so wow. I think I that's very there. proactive <laughs> yeah I think a few of them were quite pushy I think they wanted the rooms to be filled and they were like oh yeah you have to come on the Friday mm -hmm. um, so I went and I was like, guys, I am going to be jet lagged, just FYI. Um, but yeah, I ended up taking the first flight I saw because it just had a really, again, my gut feeling was just like moving here, like um, it's going to be fun. Yeah. Um, with two expat guys and it was just really social. I met loads of people through them. Um, it was really good, good first place to live, I think. Yeah, I think that's helpful. You know, when you move to somewhere new, if you can find people that maybe we're in a similar boat to you and have found their feet already, you know, that yeah. doesn't always help. And they can kind of introduce you to others and kind of build that network that's so important. Totally. Um, so one of the things I also wanted to ask you was, how did you find working in Hong Kong in terms of, you know, working at a fashion company? Was it any different to the ones you'd worked at in the UK? Like did the way of working, way of, you know, day-to-day -day structure and things like that, was it different? Yeah, it felt really different and I didn't know what to expect really. So um, I got there and I like even like how to dress, like I wasn't sure. And I got it so wrong on the first day because I remember shopping with my mum before I went out and everything I picked up, she's like, oh, it's too short or whatever. But I was like, it's going to be hot, right? I need something. And like, I think I bought some kind of like cotton dress that was like above the knee. Then when you get to the office, everywhere in Hong Kong, is just really heavy air con so I was freezing all day <laughs> in a fridge so you soon learn these things you're like okay got that so wrong um but the office atmosphere is very different um the, the Hong Kong offices tend to be very quiet um and I really like that it was very calming so you could just really get on with your work yeah. um I remember in London Devon was definitely like this MS was similar people shouting over the desk <laughs> yep Piles of paper all over the desk. It's, it's, there's an atmosphere. It's great. You Chaotic just... in the best way. <laughs> yeah. as, as a natural introvert, I found the atmosphere in Hong Kong, my way of working, it suited it. So um, that was really nice. It was a pleasant surprise, I think, for how quickly I settled in. I didn't find anything about starting work there hard. It, they looked after me, the company, a lot. 
Um, there was, at the time, there was only one other expat in the company. And um, that would change throughout the years. Some, I think at the most, there was four of us. Yeah. And at one point, I was the only expat. That was for a couple of months, um, which I didn't think was a big thing. I, I was like, this is fine. Um, totally getting on with it. And all the girls I worked with were really sweet. But then when the second expat came in, I did realize it was nice to have someone in that same group as you. Um, yeah. Yeah. No, I didn't find any real challenges. I think the way of working is very different um, and you just have to get used to that and understand that people will have different responses and different reactions because it's a different culture. Yeah. It's just about adapting and, you know, just having some idea, I guess, before you go to another country that that's probably what's yeah. going to happen. Like it's not all going to be the same. Um, so how long were you was it four years you were in Hong Kong for is it yeah just under I did like three and a half years there so what made you decide to kind of move on from Hong Kong was your reason or one of your reasons for leaving I think it was a really hard decision because it's such a great place you feel like you could stay forever but then things at the beginning that did not bother you at all after three and a half years start to bother you so Obviously, there's a lot of pollution there. The weather can be really humid. I would miss things I didn't even know that I would miss. Like, obviously, the apartments are really tiny. Um, and I love cooking. And when you first get there, you don't care because you're just having so much fun. But after a few years, it's like, oh, I miss that element of my life again. I just want to go to a big supermarket with loads of food to choose from and cook a nice, healthy meal at home. You don't really have the space or the supermarkets to do that, really um so yeah just little things and I notice myself obviously I'm from the UK but I feel quite aligned to Europe obviously probably the same as you and like going on holidays when you were younger and stuff yeah. and I noticed when we do some trips back to Europe I really my heart really started to miss that culture um I still have it here in Australia because it's, di it's different culture and I have this real pull at the moment to like towards back to Europe but um yeah things that felt like nothing at the beginning after three and a half years you're kind of sick of um so I think it was more of a person it was nothing to do with work it was definitely a personal choice like I had a dream job um and I was at an amazing company and also um pay tends to be better in Hong Kong than it is in Europe and then the tax is much lower so you can really put your head down and do some good saving which is great because I yeah. definitely can do that in London yeah I think that's what's really helpful about when you do move overseas because a lot of companies do pay more in other countries yes. and also depending on who you work for I know obviously we've had friends that you know we've even had their accommodation paid for and yeah. like that so I mean it depends on what kind of deal that you're able to get but there's lots of different ways you know that you're able to save so it's actually kind of a good option if you're trying to do that um, yeah. so why did you decide or how did you decide on Australia yeah, so I've always had a little of a soft spot for Australia because, I mean, like the weather, the beaches, the beautiful nature. It's got some great cities as well. Um, I'd been here as a backpacker and I'd absolutely loved it. I had such a great time. Um, so it was always on my mind and it's not far from Hong Kong. So when I was in Hong Kong, I'd visit. Um, my brother also lives in Sydney and I have quite a few friends in the country as well already. So, yeah, I definitely had a pull there, but... I think when I knew I was ready to leave, I, was, I wasn't I was naive about the industry. I knew it's not about me being able to pick the country. It's about me finding where the jobs are because it doesn't work like that, especially lingerie design. It's so niche. Mm. So I put a global wide search out basically. Um, and I ended up interviewing with two companies in Melbourne, one in Sydney, um, one in Amsterdam and one in San Francisco. And gradually, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I it was like, I would not, I was so excited for all of them. Um, but gradually there'd be reasons the process would stop. Like, for example, one role, I was like, they sent me the project and the pro I found the project too easy. And I don't think I'd ever had that project um, problem before. So I was kind of like, I should probably retract my application to this one. Um, and then various, maybe, I don't think I got maybe the one in San Francisco or something. So it was just naturally narrowing down. Um, so yeah, it was, it brought me to Australia. So, I mean, I know all this, but this is obviously for the benefit of everyone else. I know that when you obviously chosen your job in Australia, it was quite 
I don't know how else to say this, bit of a bull lake really when it came to the visa process. Cause I think yeah. from what I understand, Australia is a little bit like what my experience has been of, of the US in just the visa is absolute nightmare and can take a really long time and involves a lot more effort than what it sounds like your Hong Kong one was. Yeah, it was a lot of more work for sure. And the money involved as well, the company having to sponsor you, it's a lot more. Um, now, would I actually wouldn't put that on Australia. They, yeah, they ask for a lot more documents, but the reason my visa was held up that time was actually because one of the documents they needed was a police clearance from Hong Kong. Um, and for whatever reason, police, um, Hong Kong police took nearly two months to get it to me, and it should have only been a couple of weeks. So that was the only document pending. Um, and I given up my flat, I'd handed my notes in at work and I thought, you know, this is going to be a couple of weeks, it's fine. But I actually ended up going home to the UK on the plan for two months. Um, so that was, at first I was furious, but it was over December and January. Um, and it was actually quite a nice time to go home. But it was just that couple of months of living in limbo. Like I, I actually started to think, wow, what if I don't get this visa? I've just given them everything in Hong Kong because you can't get the timings exact. It's hard. Yeah. And is it, I don't have a clue, but is it similar to a US visa in that? Because when I did mine, they literally expect like a hundred page document. And that includes all these different forms. It also includes um, examples of your work, examples of if you've had any press coverage. It, it, it's really like quite over the top. For what they so were I think the them. US for you it sounds harder we didn't have to do any of that like I needed references from past jobs and to, to prove that expertise so basically it's, sure it's the same sort of rule but they have to prove that no one in Australia can do that role um, yeah, same. same kind of uh, ethos um, and I think being in laundry that isn't generally isn't too hard because it's in its own niche they don't have the training for it here. There's no colleges that specialize in it. Whereas in the UK, there's a few. That makes sense. So it's probably a little bit easier on that side of things. Yeah. So, I mean- it's harder because there's like less jobs, obviously, so. Yeah, that's true. So with the transition to Australia, did you find it easier because there wasn't as much of a language barrier? Like, well, how is it different to your experience of, you know, your transition to Hong Kong? Weirdly, I actually found it a lot harder. Oh, okay. I wasn't yeah. expecting you to say that. <laughs> no, me I didn't expect it. I thought it would be a breeze. Um, I think you get to Hong Kong or somewhere like Hong Kong that's such a different culture to your own and you expect it to be hard. Um, but when you get there, expats are so open and so welcoming and so friendly because they've all been in the same boat. Yeah, they've been there, done that. So yeah, like you have a night out and you've you've made five new friends and people are constantly inviting you out and introducing you to people. Um, and plus I was really lucky in Hong Kong. I had like an amazing job and an amazing company. And I never felt that far away from home at Hong Kong because I could get on a direct flight for 12 hours and be back in Manchester. Mm -hmm. It would be an overnight flight. I'd just sleep through it. And yeah, yeah. It, was, it just felt like it just was such an easy move. Then I got to Australia and obviously the pure distance alone, when you arrive, it's, it's like, wow, like I've just been flying for like two days or whatever. Yeah. Um, and then I think the day I landed, because I originally started in Melbourne, um, I, it was a 43 degree day, um, really, really hot. Yeah. And it was really windy. It felt like a hairdryer was like blowing in my face and <laughs> It was a very like rough day when I arrived. Um, but yeah, I've just found it um, a little bit more difficult and slower to meet people because it's not such an expat place. Um, so, and I also find it's similar to home, but it's not home. So in a way it makes you feel more homesick. Whereas you look around Hong Kong and nothing's like home. Yeah, it's like this one big adventure. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, I never expected you to say that. I thought it would be really easy in Australia because it would be so much like home. The no, it's definitely, yeah, it's the opposite. And I didn't think it would be. Oh, interesting. Yeah. All right, let me see what else I was going to ask you before I go to any questions. So similar question to what I asked you about Hong Kong. In terms of working out there, is it a different, like, pace of, like, 
you know, day-to-day -day life out there? How different is it working for fashion companies there compared to previous ones? So I would say there's definitely a better work-life balance here. People really respect leaving the office at a good time. People are super active in Sydney. So people will always have an exercise class booked or they're going to the beach after work, they're going swimming. So there's complete respect around that work-life balance. Yeah. Um, in terms of like when you're actually in the office or in your day working from home, it's not dissimilar to what it was like in London. It probably is a little bit slower paced. Yeah. Um, from what I can gather that seems to be within the fashion industry I don't know what the industries are like um, but the two roles I've had it since I've been in Australia have both been fast paced yeah that's interesting I always expected it I mean I think it's really good about them finishing on time and everything I expected it to be like a much more like laid back slower day to day yeah. pace over there yeah I think there are some companies like that I think I've just been at two that are quite like um manic <laughs> yeah, yeah. so from your experience so far in these different countries what would you say are kind of like your biggest like highlights and like best things about making that move because I'm sure I mean I would ask you if you regret it at all but I don't think you do so, um. <laughs> you know, what, what would you say you know is a huge advantage for someone that's thinking do you know what I really fancy a change I really want to get out there and work overseas you know what would you say is kind of the best parts about that I just feel like you're on a big adventure and you're really living and you're seeing the world and once you've done it once it's so hard to not be doing that um, so not only are you getting that personally but your resume just stands out from the crowd. Like it's, I went back to the UK now. I know it's not a good time to go back and be looking for a job, but I know my resume would stand out. Yeah. Um, that different experience, especially in fashion, if you go to Asia, because that's where the factories are. Yeah. Um, visiting them all the time, you get that real side of it um, that you wouldn't get necessarily staying in, in the UK or wherever. Um, so yeah, I think that's the main advantage. So for me, it was like, I did it for more out of at first, it was more just for a job, but on, look on reflection, just a personal adventure has been incredible. And the yeah. people you meet. Totally. And then what would you say, if you could name a couple of like the biggest struggles, what would they be? I think like in Hong Kong, the highs are really high. Like you, you are just having the best time. You're it's the weekend and you're on a boat party or you're at a champagne brunch and you <laughs> you like five new people who you think are great. So you're just having the best time. But when you're having a low day, it's pretty low. You're in your tiny little apartment. Uh, maybe it's like one of the monsoon days where it's grey and rainy outside. You can't even step outside. You just want some comfort food. You want to just be at home. Um, so yeah, like it can be a bit, it could feel a bit claustrophobic sometimes, you know, with all the sky um, high rises and you're living amongst that. You Sometimes you feel like you're just living in a concrete jungle. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think it's just hard. Whenever something goes wrong, as an expat, you're not at home. So it always feels a little bit worse. If you feel a little bit more alone or whatever. Um, but then when you get back on a high day, you're like, all right, yeah, this is why I'm doing it. Yeah, it's sometimes, and I've had that myself, it's just, you know, you'll have those good and bad days, but, you know, when they're good, they're amazing, and you know that you couldn't yeah. be doing that if you'd stayed at home. I guess staying at home is more like that, like very yeah. flat, and then expats like a like, little <laughs> So totally. before we jump into everyone's questions, um, what advice would you give to anyone that's listening that's considering a career abroad? I'd say just go for it. Like you've got nothing to lose. If you really don't like it, you could do six months and come home and at least you've got it on your resume, but you'll never know until you get out there really. Um, and I'd also be really open to where you want to go because I wouldn't, I wouldn't have picked Hong Kong. I just, there was just lingerie jobs there and it, it turned out to be just such the best experience. So yeah. No, I completely agree. I think um, I was very similar to you too. I, I literally applied anywhere and everywhere. Yeah. And I landed between Hong Kong and the US and picked yeah, it. Yeah. It was kind of exciting, just, you know, not really having a clue like where I was going to end up, Absolutely. not really having an agenda, I didn't just set out to move to one country. I was like, well, wherever it takes me. <laughs> and you may as well apply for all of them because then you, if you're not feeling sure about it, you can just turn one down, stop the application, 
But if you yeah. see something and it even gives you a bit of curiosity, you should just apply. Yeah, because you never know where it's going to take you. Yeah. Um, so we had a few questions. So let me see what we've got here. Someone's actually on this in Hong Kong right now. Oh, amazing. Something in fashion. Someone said, what other steps did you take to meet people and make connections in the new countries you were in? Um, Hong Kong was really easy. I knew two people out there already, but I didn't know them well. And through them, I met loads of people. Um, people are super open. And I guess it's the same in Singapore, Dubai, all those real expat cities. I, I'm assuming they're all the same. Yeah. Um, Australia is a bit more difficult. Um, like I said, people have grown up here. It's not an expat city or country necessarily. Um, so they've all got their own networks already. So I think you've just got to push yourself really. Again, use any contacts you've got. So, you know, has your friend at home got a friend in Melbourne? Make them put you in touch. Go meet them for a drink. Just get yourself out there. Um, and, you know, there's always groups and things you can join. I moved to Sydney in February from Melbourne. And obviously I was here for like four or five weeks and then there was lockdown. So it's been, this year has just been really difficult to meet people. But I think, I don't know, it's, it's happening It's happening slowly. And I think as long as you're patient and don't beat yourself up about it, if you're like, oh my God, I don't know anyone. Well, yeah, maybe you don't. You only moved here like a few months ago. Um, and just go easy on yourself and enjoy enjoy the city and where you've moved to and make the most of it. Yeah, totally. And there's always things like, you know, if you are struggling or say, you know, say you're living on your own or you don't maybe have the benefit of having a, a housemate that can show you around or whatever. Yeah then you know you can even just going to some like workout groups like going to the yeah. gym or totally. I mean I started going to pottery and I haven't like made a bunch of close friends there but everyone's so friendly when you go there that even just yeah. to just spend the day chatting with people you don't know and having a nice time and that you know is good enough so I think yeah, there's totally. lots of ways you can you know find people as you go for sure yeah definitely um someone said how did you find the language barrier? I'm assuming they mean for Hong Kong. Were they happy to speak English or did you have to learn Cantonese or Mandarin beforehand? Um, I didn't for Hong Kong. Um, I probably could have made more of an effort, to be honest. Um, I knew the very basics, um, but generally in Hong Kong, people are happy to speak English and most people's English is pretty good. Um, I think as well in my office, it was an English speaking office and they were very happy that I was speaking English in that in the design department and a lot of the girls the Hong Kongese girls their English improved when I started uh well just having a, a British speaker there um and they were really happy with that so I was kind of encouraged to just stick to my own language at work so yeah totally and the thing is I mean those languages are quite hard to learn anyway. It's not like when you're yeah. in Europe and you know, maybe you're in Italy or somewhere, you can learn some basic Italian to get you by. Like Cantonese yeah. and Mandarin is actually like, really difficult. So yeah. I don't think uh, you expect me to know it. Yeah, there was no expectation. You, you're right. Like um, I didn't feel any pressure to. Um, and Cantonese is only spoken in Hong Kong and a uh, one part of China. So it's not a wide language. Oh, I didn't realise that. I thought it was spoken in more places than that. No, it's just Hong Kong and Guangzhou, which is like pretty much next to Hong which Kong. Which is pretty much on the border. Mm. Um, so another question, how keen were employers to have an expat? Did they help you move or did they treat you the same as a native applicant? So um, I found like a good response in Hong Kong. They, they basically wanted the role to be an expat. They needed that design influence from the West in the company. Um, they were a great company and they flew me out. They didn't provide me with any temporary accommodation. I organized that myself, but on reflection, I would have asked for that. Mm -hmm. I just didn't know to, um, but it's kind of, a, and then I would meet other expats in Hong Kong who'd got like crazy good packages. And I was like, oh, I should have just asked for some temporary accommodation. So then when I went to Melbourne, um, I asked for it and they they did really look after me. They flew me out. Um, and even though they thought they were flying me out from Hong Kong and I actually had to go all the way home, they did fly me from the UK, which was great. Um, they got me, they sent a chauffeur to pick me up at the airport, 
got me temporary accommodation and then helped me find a permanent flat in Melbourne, which was really nice of them. They didn't have to do that. Um, and then this wasn't in my contract, but they gave me a company car as well. So they, they from that point of view, they looked after me. Um, and then when I came to the Sydney job, I couldn't, I couldn't ask for anything because I was already in the country. So I wasn't, <laughs> even though I was an expat, there was no relocation package I could ask for. And I knew that. So, yeah, no, I can understand that. I think, I mean, back to like what, the, you know, one of the other things that um, person had asked, they were saying about, you know, how keen were employers to have an expat. I think half the reason when you're applying that you even appeal to them is because you are an expat. You know, a lot of these companies, you know, do like to take people on from other countries for a reason. And depending on what country you're from, like some people, especially in the fashion industry, are quite sought after. I know that um, from my experience when I was in um, Philadelphia, I was like Urban Outfitters, and I know they really like to hire Australians and Brits for some reason. Okay. Just, you yeah. know, if that was, they were kind of set up for that. And then they were set up yeah. with a full package to give those people that had applied. Um, and we've got a friend, our friend Mel, who, you know, yeah. was in Beijing and they gave her this amazing apartment. Yeah, hers was incredible. <laughs> so it is one of the really nice things about, you know, moving overseas is the majority of companies will offer you some kind of package. And if they don't, you're completely, as Laura said, like within your right to ask for it. Um, okay, next question. Um, do you think with me being an expat from a developing country would experience the same as yours when I start to look for work in the fashion industry in developed countries because the fashion industry from my country tends to get overlooked? Um, I don't know what country you're from, um, but I feel like, I don't know about you, what your answer would be that to Laura, but I feel like if you are sending a, a good resume and a good portfolio, yeah. it really shouldn't matter. Where I think you're you're right. Right. when you said that there are, there are certain countries they have a favoritism for possibly just because of the reputation of the fashion um, schools are there as well yeah, definitely like you, new york london paris like you can't you can't compete with that can you um yeah like for example i was talking about the uk being a lingerie um speciality but i actually didn't go on a, i wasn't on a lingerie course um so I think as long as your resume is standing out in some respect, um, they'll be interested. Yeah, and I think, you know, even if you're, you know, worried about that, you at least should try. There is absolutely no harm in trying. And I think these days as well with, you know, all these different fashion schools you can access online these days. So, yeah. you know, people shouldn't really just be looking at like what country you're from in relation to the fashion schools, because really you can do that online anywhere. Um, mm someone said how did you know what and how much to pack that's a really good question actually <laughs> yeah, yeah it's it's hard because you're literally packing everything I totally just went for it when I went to Hong Kong I took one case like I didn't even ship anything over I was just so ready to just go like I'd spent seven months looking for a job and I finally had one I was like oh it's hot in Hong Kong let's just take a few dresses and go like um, and then when I got there, I was like, oh, I wish I'd brought a bit more out. It actually does get cold in Hong Kong for about eight weeks of the year, which I learned. Um, so, yeah, I was pretty light packer. And then when I was leaving for Australia, I did have, by that point, I had some belongings in Hong Kong that I didn't want to get rid of. So I shipped some stuff over and sent some stuff back to the UK as well. Um, I had to move again now. Now I've been in Australia for two years. I've probably got quite a lot of stuff, actually. Um, I think in Hong Kong, the... I wasn't necessarily buying much homeware or anything like that. And now I've probably got a lot more, so. Yeah, and I think a lot of it will depend on the package that gets offered at maybe the company that you're going to. Yeah, that's true. true. Some places give you quite a big allowance for getting your stuff yeah. shipped over and others not so much. So I know that when I made the move from the UK to the US, I had about 10 box, like quite large boxes. And on yeah. reflection, like all the little knickknacks and stuff I packed, yeah. I did not need them. And I don't know why, because now I'm going to have them all over here. And I'm like, I was, like, well, most of them are in a box at my boyfriend's family's house <laughs> in uh, Philadelphia, because, you know, I didn't want to get rid of them, but it's, it's difficult because 
you know, I, it's hard because my parents probably would have thrown it away as well. <laughs> <laughs> but I came out here with way too many clothes, way too many knickknacks. And on reflection, I think the longer you're doing this for, the more you realize yeah. like, the less yeah. belongings you need to take with you. Like you just I, need the right yeah. clothes and whatever, everything else you can buy out here if you have to. Um, and anything that's sentimental, like just leave it home with your parents if you yeah. can. <laughs> um, someone said do you think you have to be in that place to look for a job or can you apply before move oh okay yes apply before moving also what are the keywords to look for when looking for a job abroad so it's the same like do you need to be in that country that you want to be in when you're applying well you can't always be can you um you can't always be there um i personally now think it doesn't really matter where you are like everyone's so connected with this kind of virtual world now it's so the norm um and i've never had a problem looking online if the job's advertised it will be online so were you finding yeah. them on linkedin or was it on i know you googled a lot of it but yeah on linkedin or was it on like job specific other job sites yeah i'd, I'd use linkedin but i'd also use the job sites and just general google um searches so they said, were there any keywords you looked at? Was it mainly just- I just made sure, yeah, I had the word design in there and I put lingerie, but then I can also do sleep. So I'd put, I'd do a separate one for sleep. And at some point in my career, I've even done kids wear. So I was like, well, you never know what's going on in kids wear. Like, um, just keep your search broad. Yeah, exactly. Because the thing is, they all, all, all the searches will be done by keywords. So if you are able to do a bunch of different things, yeah. like you just said, you, you might exactly. start all of them. And I guess think about your level as well. If you're looking at assistant, client, junior, senior, put that in because they're more likely to come up then. Yeah, and it'll be more focused for you. Um, mm. The other thing I wanted to just add about, do you think you have to be in the same place to look for a job? Yeah. Sometimes that's sometimes it's a good thing because it means that you are readily available if they need to see yeah. you. One of the bad things about that is I know from out here, and I think Australia might be the same, sometimes if you're already out there on some kind of tourist visa, you're not actually technically allowed yeah. to jump from that to like a sponsored yeah. visa. So that actually gets frowned upon. So you do have to be a little bit careful with all the legal stuff mm -hmm. and all of that. Um, someone said, how would you highlight your expat experience going for future roles? And what advice would you give to getting a good moving or benefit package? Um, so I think the highlights I can take from, so to, for me going forward is without a doubt, working in Hong Kong, working in Asia, the exposure I had to the manufacturing side of design. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think for Australia, it, I'm actually designing for the Southern hemisphere, which is totally new for me. So the seasons are reversed and that's and it's a different market so I think it's given me some good skills there um so yeah there's whatever expat situation you're in there's always a different um culture going on or different experience which you can just talk about um and it's going to make you stand out from the crowd really yeah and then what advice would you give to getting a good moving or benefit package obviously with your experience and on reflection things you like you'd wish you'd yeah on. I think just be confident about it maybe do some research on what other people have had what they've got because I just didn't know what existed if I'd done a bit of research I could have probably got a better package but just be confident in yourself and ask for it they're only going to say no aren't they yeah I think just having a bit of confidence and self-worth yeah. really and that you know you know you're good you know that they want you otherwise it wouldn't have gotten to that point exactly so then it's just being a bit more confident about asking what you what is going to be required for you to make that move yeah because you've got to remember you're <clears throat> as much as you might want to do it it's a big thing for you to do and they need to support you doing that yeah 100 percent. because even just you know moving to another country is not cheap and no. They, you know you really do ideally need to have some kind of package from a company mm -hmm. to make that move even if they're just like covering your fly like we said maybe covering some initial accommodation like yeah. you know, with mine they put me up in a hotel for a month so that I had like a bit like what you had recently like just so that I was able to then find somewhere in the yeah city. you just need that breathing space like you can't well I did it but you, I was gonna say you can't land and just start looking for places you just you need to sort of settle in etc 
Yeah, you definitely had to do it the hard way. But I think in an ideal world, if you at least have a few weeks, then you can actually get to know the area and, yeah. you know, make sure that you're picking somewhere ideal that you want to live. Um, okay, so that's all the questions. And awesome. I think that is it. Let me just close that. So I just want to thank, oh, one more before we go. Someone's just <laughs> How would you compare Melbourne and Sydney in terms of fashion? As in, would you say it's more suitable for fashion or keen for fashion? I've heard Sydney is not that big on fashion, but curious to hear from someone that's there. So in terms of the cities, like Melbourne is way more forward. It's got more of a fashion scene going on. It's got better boutiques. It's just a cool, cooler city. Um, however, in terms of jobs, it's, I'd say it's 50 the split between the two there's yeah there's a decent amount to apply for in both and would you say in terms of like being fashion forward is one more like trendy than the other by like a lot or definitely Melbourne yeah Sydney's more about fitness and and that kind of like most people are in active wear here um oh, really? so, yeah so are they all like in the O'Neills and the Quicksilvers and all that kind of stuff it's like, yeah, yeah, I guess the surfer guys are, but the the it's probably a little bit LA style. Um, so if you go and do the coastal walk now, there's girls in the sports bras and the matching leggings, um, and yeah, they'll be looking very glam, um, very tanned, toned, perfect bodies. So yeah, no, I found that when we came to California, I was like, oh my gosh, I can't yeah, <laughs> you're, great. you're like what, <laughs> pasty and white. <laughs> Um, someone also just asked, um, I want to ask about visas, working, a visa working holiday Australia. How was your experience? Uh, is it worth it? Can we build out our career with the visas? Oh, I guess they're asking if you had like a holiday visa in Australia, can yeah. you build out some kind of career? For yeah, you? you totally can. Um, I came out on a little break again, like I'd um, taken some time out from when I was at London and I just wanted to relax a bit and travel so I came out to Australia on the working holiday visa and I could have got a fashion job and I applied for a few because I thought I wouldn't mind staying if I got one yeah. but I was just so in a chilled headspace I probably did it quite half-heartedly I didn't really go for it so I didn't end up getting anything but I do know people who have done that they came out here on a working holiday and they got you then get put on a bridge visa which is just an in-between bit until your sponsorship one comes through Perfect. So it's definitely doable then. Yeah, totally. Cool. Well, I'm going to wrap it up there. So, oh gosh, we keep getting more <laughs> about to wrap it up. I hate not answering. Oh my gosh, questions. Sydney. Okay, Sydney has better weather. Definitely. Nice. I know, I really want to come visit you <laughs> one day. <laughs> um so thank you everyone for joining us um obviously a special thank you to laura for taking the time to share her story and her experience and for providing us with a ton of really amazing advice um i hope it's been useful to you all um don't forget to check out the series that she did with us called diary of a fashion expat which is on the website fashionthefree.com i think there was like seven parts of the series that yeah. you did so yeah there's if anyone wants to have a nice read for the evening, then uh, there's seven chapters to get through. <laughs> um, if you enjoyed our chat today, we'd really appreciate you sharing your feedback with us, um, sharing the video link once I've posted the recording. Um, and yeah, so thank you very much. And thank you so much, Laura, for doing yeah. this with us today. Yeah, thank you for having me. No problem. Well, I hope you have a really nice evening. I will, thank you. Um, so yeah, thank you very much, everybody. Enjoy the rest of your evenings, days, wherever you are in the world. Um, oh, yeah, thank I'm so you. sorry. I, I know I know you have to go, so sorry. Is oh, this yeah. last for you? I was just kind of curious, like, is this last? Are you going to stay in Sydney or do you think you're going to go somewhere else? Or, and if are there any other places that you were thinking about? Um, I've just had my visa renewed for two years. Um, and that's all I've got left after that. Like, once I've done two years, it's done. I can't stay any longer. So yeah, it's on my mind. I'm just going to see what happens. Um, I actually went to see a clairvoyant the other week because I was feeling quite curious about it. Um, she says she can see me staying here, but I'm not sure how because let's see what happens with the visa. But um, yeah, who knows?
Cool. Thank you very much for that. Um, and yeah, enjoy the rest of the day, everyone. Thank you again, Laura. Bye.